They see a competitor down the street who's extraordinarily successful driving the brand new Bentley. He's all over the buses. He's all over the billboards. He's all over the TV. He's all over the radio. And you say to yourself, I want to be that guy or gal. And that is a recipe for disaster. Okay. It is. I'm going to comment on disaster. this because I know some personal attorneys that I've worked for that they Facebook stock other attorneys. Yeah. They digitally stock other attorneys. They'll get people from their own law office to go into their competitor's law office. Right. And, and almost kind of say, I want you to bring back information of how they interviewed you, how they do the intakes, how they do the cons- Hello, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to the LegalSoft podcast. My name is Javier Perez. I'm the head of marketing here at LegalSoft. My background, just a little bit, this, for the last 11 years, I've been working with legal operations and legal marketing for medium to small legal law firms. And now here at LegalSoft, uh, managing the marketing operations for internal and external clients. We have an incredible guest today, Adam Rettman, who is our Legal Soft Director of Law Firm Growth. Adam, welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here again. I'm honored to get in front of the camera, and uh, and it's great to talk to you, Javier. Uh, just for background purposes, I've got you beat by one year. I've been in the legal space for 12 years. I, my first pos- role in the industry was as scratch that was a director of sales for a digital marketing agency for law firms where we did live events, coaching, consulting. Um, I've worked in a few hundred law firms in those 12 years, and uh, my real special pet project has always been the best practices of intake and lead conversion. Um, as a coach, I dive into law firms and I look at uh, people, processes, and software, and then having systems, necessary systems to support all of that to help law firms get to where they want to be. Some law firms want to grow. Some law firms want to keep it small, keep it all. No problem at all. But I want to help them have more efficient running law firms so that they can have a lifestyle that uh, that uh, keeps them happy and keeps them in the game. So. Fantastic. It seems like you're a very seasoned professional in the legal firm and legal firm growth. That's mm-hmm. fantastic. Uh, today's podcast, we're going to be discussing a couple of key elements, but within law firm growth. Uh, I'd like to really kind of touch on uh, how you're going to grow a law firm, maybe the uh, return on investment, ROI. And last, which I think is most important, better manage the operating expenditure of a law firm. So Adam, what's the difference between a law firm owner and a lawyer? Wow, that's that's a great question. I've never really had anybody ask me that. So yeah, let's think about lawyers for, 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 for just a minute, right? They overachieve as undergrads, and they get the vision, they're going to take the LSAT and go to law school. They go to law school and the law school spits out technicians. At the end of their three years in law school, they're technicians. They're not, they're not trained business owners. Last time I checked, Javier, there are no business courses during law school, right? There are none. The first class is usually what? Contracts? You've gone to law school, right? I have, yes. Right? So you do torts, contracts. Tell me about the business courses that you took when you went to law school. I did not take one. There you go, right? So it doesn't, the world prepares amazing technicians, but horrible business owners. Not because you're not smart. Obviously, you're smart, but they get out and it's like, what do I do? I don't know how to own a business, run a business, right? I agree. Right? It's been really interesting, too, because uh, the law firms that I've been involved with and the reason why I was brought in was that lawyers are amazing at the law. Their practice could be in civil, it could be in in criminal, Mm -hmm. could be in real estate and family, but they know the law very well. What they're poor at is running their business. 100%. And may it be because they need a bookkeeper. I've seen law firms' lights turn off because they didn't pay the bill, which was I found very comedic. awful. Yes, but they also don't know anything really about marketing because they don't have that creative ability. Mm -hmm. So then they need to go out and hire marketing people or marketing agency. So lawyers are a very unique breed. 100%. I agree totally. Super smart, right? A lot are very aggressive, entrepreneurial spirit, but they get out of law school and they don't know how to begin, right? 
here's the typical path that I've experienced. And you can stop me because you've lived this, right? Get out of school. You got a mountain of debt. Take the first job that comes in your door. Typically, that means you are working in a firm and it may or may not may or may not even be in the practice area that you were interested in. But you've got loans to pay, rent, cars, suits, clothes, right? You got the full gamut, not to mention this mounting law school debt to pay back, which is right. So they take their first job. Sometimes you land in a great place and you get a good mentorship, you get good training, right? Good coaching. And then at year seven, the law firm pulls you in. And this is, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. Law firm pulls you in at year seven and says, Hey, Javier, we love what you're doing. Our clients love you. Now what you need to do, Javier, is go out and make it rain. In other words, you need to start bringing in clients, originating your own business, and you'll make partner in lickety split. And then Javier, and I'm using you as the example, looks in the mirror and goes, what the hell am I going to do? I don't know how to make it rain. I don't even know what they mean. Right? That's right. No, it, it was really interesting because my uh, background, not only, yes, in law, entertainment, sports, marketing, when I started dipping into the law firms, uh, it was much later into life. Mm -hmm. um, I was introduced into a big business or a big federation. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, I finished law school, became an attorney. And after I retired my position, then I went in, I was recruited to go into the law firm. It, it. And it, right away it was, you know, you eat what you kill. Right. And that's exactly yeah. the point that you're, you're going is, yes, you want to, you want to make partner, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Right. And I wasn't prepared for that at the very beginning. Now, much different, of course. Now much different. Yep. Now you're in marketing. You love the law so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my point is, right, and you're spot on. That that story is is not a, is very common. I've heard this hundreds of times. So year seven, they call them in in the firm. You're tracking. We love you. Clients love you. You need to go out and make it rain. And then the associate has a decision to make. I'm gonna suck my. I'm gonna suck it up. I'm gonna learn how to make it rain. I'm gonna network and bring in business for the firm who's getting rich off of my hard work. Or I'm going to go out and I'm going to open my own firm. I'm going to do better. I'm going to make more money, right? I've got a great book of business, right? So off they go and they hang their shingle and they get a little office space. They get a desk. They got a computer. And they're like, no problem. I'm going to run a law firm. And for six months, they do really, really well because they've got a great book of business, friends and family. They burn through referrals that they know, right? And at about month six, Javier, they lift up their head and they go, okay, when's the next one coming in? Right, right. That's when some of the challenges come in, where they they can't pay to pay the electric bill, right? All can't these pay the rent. can't pay the rent, can't pay Payroll. can't pay their rent, can't pay back their loans that they've been mounting, right? right? So that's where a guy like you can come in and save the day. Like, let's teach you some marketing strategy, right? Tell me you budgeted some money, you put some money away for marketing, right? Tell me you put your thought some thoughts into a website, social media, content, blogging. Right. Tell me you did. And most of them do not. When when I was approached, they will always approach me and say, how can you help my business? Mm -hmm. And I, I say this often here in this office, I would unravel this big ball of spaghetti, which was, <laughs> right. you know, marketing operations and business. Mm -hmm. So does it start with marketing? Then it starts with operations. Then it starts with accounting. Then obviously uh, the the trickle down theory all the way down to sales, mm -hmm. which then creates cases, depending of what type of law firm uh, you were working for. Mm -hmm. So those were always the basics. They were really just bring me clients and I'll manage them or I'll be their lawyer. They didn't know that big buildup. Maybe they had a couple, some in corporate, some in private, mm -hmm. but it was very, very difficult to some of the law firm owners. And it was really interesting because I've seen law firm owners transition to becoming just a lawyer at another law firm yeah. because the stress wasn't there. The responsibility wasn't there. Yeah. And they said, well, I'd, I'd rather just receive a paycheck instead of managing, a, uh, managing an office. Yeah, it's okay. true. Right. Yeah. You could go back out and get a J O B job, mm -hmm. right. Or you can try and, you can try and run your, and you're right. I've, I've come across some guys and gals like that too, that left like the headache of running their own firm. Right. But again, it's, it's not that, Lawyers aren't extraordinarily smart. Obviously, they are. 
you are talented, you've prepped, you studied your butts off to get where you want to be, but they just don't have the business skill set to run a business, right? And and they haven't done the basic preparation. Like I live by, as a coach, I always live by the tenets of what Michael Gerber teaches in the E-Myth. So if you're listening, I strongly recommend all of you to go out and invest 19 bucks or $14 on Amazon in Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth Revisited. Okay. It's the book that I live in as a coach, right? And simply what Gerber says is it's very, very hard to be the entrepreneur, the technician, and the manager of your own small business without really, really being challenged professionally, personally, economically. It's very, very hard. And that's that lack of preparation that lawyers put into running a law firm. And hey, I've made, had an amazing career because of that fact that lawyers are ill-prepared to run their own businesses. And that's what law firms are. Exactly. Interesting. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Sure. In your In your point of view, how does a lawyer step into an executive role smoothly and as easily as possible? Executive being someone that's running their own business or? A lawyer that fits into an executive role at an existing law firm. So he's he's currently a lawyer. And he does so well over the last five years mm -hmm. that the board and upper management, the other partners say, hey, I think that he would be a great partner. Let's invite him into an executive role. Right. So from personal experience, my wife is an attorney. She's a partner at an insurance defense litigation firm in, in our hometown where we live. So how do they prepare themselves? And I think the number one thing that happens in big law firms like that, as you mentioned, they're really like corporations, right? They're run like corporations. So you have to fit the mold. You have to be part of the team. You have to go to the events, right? Show up for the holiday parties. Go to the team happy hours, right? So you have to put in the offline work to show the firm that you're invested in their organization. And the other thing, Javier, is, as you well know probably, You've got to hustle your ass off and hit the billable hour requirements. That's really about it. Be a good citizen, show up for the events. And there's a high likability factor there. But mainly, I think primarily, do good work. Do good work. And then the other piece, which is the piece that I was talking about earlier, is you need to be able to go out and generate your own clients for the firm. I agree. And I'm just going to go ahead and add to that. I think it's always very, very important to know how to manage. I think to to get into that executive role, you have to know how to manage your staff and other staff because they're the ones that are going to be your support mechanism to be able to achieve either higher revenue, more cases, more clients, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. So uh, just my, my two cents. Sure. Because I've seen people at the law, big law firms like at Latham & Watkins or at Wilkie, at Dayton's, uh, that they've been offered these executive positions and then they say, give it a thought for about a week. And they say, that's not for me. I would just rather be a lawyer. How interesting. Yeah. And I'd rather stay right here where I'm at. Yeah. It's, Mid middle yeah. management's okay with me. Right. It's like the law firm owner that wants to keep it small, keep it all. Same kind of thought process. Right. And also there's a thought process that when you make partner, you actually have to work harder because now all of a sudden you're paying for support staff. And right? yes. And I also think that some people and some lawyers, they don't just, they don't want that responsibility. That's right. They would rather take on the responsibility of their client mm -hmm. instead of taking on the responsibility of the firm. Yeah. And because that seems to be more stressful than what they're working on on a day-to-day -day basis. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. How can the internal structure of a law firm affect a new client? Yeah, immensely. It's a really good question. No one's ever asked me this. So if you think about the potential client in the legal space, they have a problem, right? We're in a problem-solving business. And the way that law firms micromanage that client's experience can be a difference between a very, very satisfied client that gets a great result, or at least they know that the firm fought to get them a great result, right? And that gets you more and more five-star Google reviews. It sounds very, very simple. But here's something that I, I teach all of my law firms, all my coaching clients. Buyer's remorse in, in, in legal sets in in the client's head after about 90 days. Take personal injury, for example. They come in. The consultation goes well. The attorney says, hey, it looks like it's probably going to be 12 to 18 months before you're going to get a check. 
the client goes home and they go, hey, my lawyer told me I'm going to get a check in 90 days. <laughs> Happens every single day. Happens all the time. Personal injury yes. at 90 days, buyer's remorse checks uh, sets in. The client goes, well, wait a second. They're, they're being inundated by ads and billboards and radio and TV from other personal injury law firms. And they're like, why did I hire this Johnson guy when this other guy in a wreck get a check, said he was going to get me a check, right? Where's my check? Where's Right? So what I always teach all of our coaching clients is you need to have a list of all your active clients. And every single month in personal injury especially, you call every single client in your book of business, business twice a month just to check in. Just to say hello. How are you doing? That's right. Right. Nothing's changed on our end. Your case is progressing nicely. How are things going for you? Okay. It's a 90 second phone call that cuts down on 90% of the inbound status calls that can crush a law firm's existence. I agree. Okay. I, I agree 100%. I think that just touching base, just doing customer service management mm -hmm. helps out quite a bit. And it actually lowers the anxiety of a right. client because then they realize that you are working for them. That's right. A hundred percent. And so what that does is, and here's the other thing, Javier, that's None of the law firms that I've coached in my 12 years has ever been reported to the state bar in any state for over communicating to their client. It's always the opposite. Right. Right. That's correct. So that's sort of the, the method to the madness. There's that little touch, touch, touch that, that is a game changer. Right. It's an interesting one. The, the next question I have is always really an interesting one because it can go one of two ways. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to ask this one to you because I think that you may have different insight. What's the secret of becoming a very successful law firm? Wow. That's a big question. It is. Surrounding yourself with people, processes, and software that will help you get to the next level, whatever the next level in your mind is. Maybe you want to free up free time so you can have a great lifestyle, right? Maybe you want to build a monster firm and just run a business, right? So you need to have your goal and you need to write it down and you need to be relentless in the pursuit of that goal, okay? Now that could mean growing and scaling by adding virtual, investing in, in marketing agencies to get you more leads, whatever that may be. You got to have a plan and you got to write it down. I agree 100%. I think that you know, after speaking to to Hamid Cohen and his philosophy has been very, very clear mentoring other attorneys is it's communication, management, planning. That's right. And if you could do that with your clients, you'll become very, very successful, no matter at a, a small, medium size or enormous law firms, international right. multi-tier law firms. Yeah, I agreed. think that uh, as we were going back to earlier, if you could just touch base and, and communicate with your clients, great. If you have great marketing, great staff doing the marketing and communication, amazing. And all that then results into sales, that sales will bring you new clients and your salespeople really know how to market and promote your brand with the customer service. And once they even get over to the attorneys that are really going to manage their case, mm -hmm. all, that other, all those other pieces, just it's rinse and repeat. That's right. And if you have that really dialed in, I think that you will have a very, very successful law firm. That's right. And by the way, when I mentioned having someone, a client liaison, if you will, if you will, touch all of your clients every month, it can't be the attorney, the law, or the law firm owner that's making those phone calls. You need to have someone in as a client liaison that does that. So there you go. Yep. Moving on. Here we go. This is always an interesting question because um, it, many people have had uh, different opinions on it. Mm -hmm. Why should you avoid the scorched earth policy when it comes to competitors? In other words, why should you avoid going balls to the wall? So here's why. Lawyers have a fear, have FOMO. They suffer from FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. They see a competitor down the street who's extraordinarily successful driving the brand new Bentley. He's all over the buses. He's all over the billboards. He's all over the TV. He's all over the radio. And you say to yourself, I want to be that guy or gal. And that is a recipe for disaster. Okay. It is. I'm going to comment on disaster. this because I know some personal attorneys that I've worked for that they Facebook stock other attorneys. Yeah. They digitally stock other attorneys. They'll get people from their own law office 
to go into their competitor's law office right. and, and almost kind of say, I want you to bring back information of how they interviewed you, how they do the intakes, how they do the consult. It is amazing. I've said this, I say this, I've said this many, many times. People that I've graduated with and people I've worked with that are attorneys, they, attorneys are amazing at knowing the law, but they're the most insecure. Yep. 100%. <laughs> the most insecure people that I know and jealous. They are jealous of yep. uh, the law firm across the street, of the, you know, in and out of more clients that they're getting. So and then they'll go to their fo- their social media to say, well, what are they doing that I'm not doing? Yeah. Anyway. No, that's true. The thousands of firms that I've coached through the years, right? I've always espoused one strategy that has been a difference maker in their firms. Be contrary. Don't go with the rest of the herd. The guy or gal that are leading the market are spending a million dollars a month on pay-per-click. They can outspend you five to one. Spend $5,000 a month and do something different. Give away bicycle helmets. Go to go to offline marketing events. Yes, guerrilla right? marketing. Yeah, so experiential marketing. Absolutely. Do, I'm always contrary. Don't be the salmon that goes upstream. Go the opposite. And I guarantee you the phone will start ringing and you'll have more fun and sign up more clients than ever before. I could not agree with you more. Cannot agree with you more. Moving on to the next one, which is always very, very interesting. And again, people have different opinions of it, but it's a very strategic question. Mm -hmm. How does a lawyer stand out in a crowded market? Yeah. And I think it touches on what we were just talking about a little bit ago. Be contrary. I'm not saying go out and stand on the street with a red, you know, a, a rainbow colored wig and wave a sign. I'm just saying be strategic, be strategic, be transparent and write your goals down, but don't follow the rest of the herd. The herd is the herd because they are outspending everybody else in most major metropolitan cities five to one. You cannot compete with them, nor should you. Okay. The firms that succeed, Javier, are not the best lawyers, they're firms that have the best processes. Document your processes. Surround yourself with other A players. Get rid of the C Absolutely. players, right? Absolutely. All yes. of those things. No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that some of the other uh, law firms that I won't mention, I know that the founders of them have always said, I started this law firm I'm not a great attorney, but I'm a great businessman. Yeah. So I've just surrounded myself around great attorneys to create this great law firm. Right. And I always found that very, very interesting. For it's sure. So, so some people are in the business of it. Some people are in for the law of it. And the other side, exactly to your point, I've always said in Los Angeles and the metropolitan areas that, that PI – obviously personal injury, has always been a very saturated market. You could walk down one of the main avenues here in Los Angeles and you'll see 16 different billboards with 16 different attorneys and they're all advertising personal injury, personal injury, personal injury. Right. When I've talked to many of these other attorneys that wanted to start their own business, I said, well, don't go into personal injury. Right. And they would say, why? It's high... The, the amounts that you make are incredible. Yes, over two years and then... Do you have something that's going to sustain you for those two years? Mm-hmm. And, and PI is very, very competitive because don't think that they're only calling you. They're going to call you. They're going to call him. They're going to call her right mm-hmm. down the street. So be very careful. And I said, you know, pick something that you are going to enjoy because I have a philosophy. My philosophy is you do things because uh, you're going to have fun and there's great management, not because of the money because the money will come. Sure. I've always said that, yeah. and, and I've been proven correct many, many times, is that I've never done something. For, I did in my early careers, and my God, I was miserable, Yeah, which then proved it to say that you want to end up in a law firm or in a company where there's proper management instead of going where the money's at, because the money will always come. For sure. I, I know an incredible attorney that is out of uh, Texas, and she was working in uh, civil, uh, civil and criminal law. Mm-hmm. And she goes, "Wow, the, all the work that I put in it was incredible, and all the competitors that were comp- it was just massive." And she made a just dramatic switch over to immigration, mm. and she was making eighteen times more than she was working less hours. Yeah, 
and building a small little team around her, mm-hmm. working in immigration, then all those long 14, 16 hour days where her hair was falling out mm-hmm. and making just a, a bit over over seven figures. Anyway, my again, my two cents. Yeah, no, it's great. If I was a fresh out of school, and I've had this question asked me a dozen times in the last year, I think I want to go into personal injury in Los Angeles. And I've steered so many law firms out of that idea very, very quickly for all the reasons you just mentioned and many, many more. Primarily, uh, click, auto accident click in L.A. County is like 2500 bucks right now. Right. A click. That's not yeah. even a lead. Yeah. That's a click. You know, you're the marketing guy, right? Yes. Click. And, and then that- also just the average payout on a personal injury accident is right around $6,700. Right. You almost have to balance that. It's like, really, if we're yep. going to do this on a contingency, we're only making a couple thousand dollars That's on, right. you know, 100 hours that we're going to put into this. Is it really worth it? You right. almost have to balance it's that. It's a balancing you, act. You almost have to wait for the big, you know, semi-truck with a, you know, the through the major distribution logistics companies mm-hmm. to hit you so it's worth your time. Right. Anyway. Right. Well, um, as we're kind of inching our way to the very end here, um, we're going to go more into your personal career here. Is mm-hmm. is that what are you currently working on? I mean, what what excites you? I mean, I think the 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 people that are listening today, yeah, they want to know. Okay, Adam, what do you do on a day to day basis, and what are you working on? Yeah. So, what gets me up in the morning is my excitement at the thought. That I'm going to be able to, it's just like lawyers, right? We get to help solve problems, right? I've worked in hundreds, thousands of law firms where they just didn't, they didn't, they couldn't put one foot in front of the other. And so for me, it's just like lawyers out there. They are there to help people solve their, solve problems. I like to help law firm owners solve theirs. So for me, it's diving into a firm saying, Hey, this is what my experience is. I'm going to help you avoid any of those landmines moving forward. And I really get to ask great questions like, you know, what do you want to do with this thing? Right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Right? And I help people, law firm, business owners live out their dreams. Like I help them scale by adding virtual assistance at the right moment. Who, where do they need help? How do I patch up holes in the leaky bucket? Right? Where are you losing money? Where are the opportunities? So for me, that's what I'm passionate and excited about. And I wake up every day super excited to uh, to help. That's help fantastic. Some, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because as I analyze many of these different law firms that you're talking about and mm-hmm. how you wake up, I always find it very interesting how some of these law firms will ask us, you know, how do you feel that we're going to improve our business? Mm-hmm. And And sometimes I say... Uh, well, you have to manage your OPEX, your your operating expenditure. Mm-hmm. So let's balance it. Why don't you hire a remote paralegal? Mm-hmm. Why don't you hire a remote case manager where a normal case manager is about $30 an hour mm-hmm. and you get a remote one that's going to cost you maybe – uh, ten to twelve dollars an hour. Right. So now you have a almost a six hundred percent savings in, in many cases. I think that you have to manage your OPEX, and I think that's exciting for me too. Is that yeah. you see the direct results of being able to use virtual assistance or virtual help or virtual support in many different categories in a law firm, and you see the direct, and then you see them happy. And they're like, wow, we never even would have thought of that. Right. We didn't even think that that was possible. But it actually improves their productivity and it helps in their overall business. Absolutely. I just got off the phone before this very podcast with someone who had the same problem that's been going on. She said, look, I can't hire in-house staff. I need a virtual paralegal immediately. I've got a buildup of cases that are just stagnating, right? So... It you know it's it that's what I'm excited about is to help her, help her get beyond this little problem they have. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Now that we're into going into the second quarter of the year, it's you see now people having their their tax refunds and their money and everything else that's mm-hmm. with businesses and individuals. You know, are you attending any new events? Are you uh, speaking at any events? Do you have any new conferences that you're attending? Yeah. So I just got back from one a couple of weeks ago that was amazing. And then in uh, April, at the end of April, third week in April, I'll be in Colorado Springs at NACBA, which is the National Association of Consumer Bankruptcy Attorneys event. Our company CEO, Hamid Cohen, is going to be speaking at that event. We've got stage time. And we're going to have an amazing booth and set up and have some great getaways. But mainly, uh, 
I love going to these events because I get to meet law firm owners and talk to them about what their, you know, what their problems are and, uh, you know, what the opportunities are to help them. And so we'll be at that event. It's going to be awesome. It's at the Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs, which is an amazing venue. And uh, it should be around three or 4,000 consumer bankruptcy lawyers at that event. I've attended it in the past. It's one of my favorites because uh, bankruptcy is an interesting area of law. There have been some great challenges in bankruptcy. Heck, there were challenges in bankruptcy even before COVID hit, right? The bankruptcies were down 30% even before we had the COVID, the two-year shutdown. And they were already down 30%, right? Yep. And then during COVID, they died, right? Right. No pun intended. Bankruptcy the courts were closed in a lot of places for several years. And just now, they're coming out. Uh, and so we anticipate, and everybody's anticipating a big bankruptcy bubble. So I expect that this year's conference is going to be amazing. It, absolutely. I think that bankruptcy is always an interesting topic. Hamid Cohen, again, the CEO of our CEO at, at mm -hmm. LegalSoft, he's wonderful to speak. I mean, hear speak at these, these conferences. He really does mm -hmm. educate all these bankruptcy attorneys and bankruptcy firms, um, to our listeners, if you ever have a chance to listen to Hamid Cohen speak at some of these different events, just tune in. He's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's great. He'll be speaking at NACPA about ways to grow, use virtual assistance to grow and scale your bankruptcy firm. That's going to be one of the topics that he'll be talking to from the main stage. So super right. exciting. Yeah, no, we're super excited. So again, just go to YouTube, type in Hamid Cohen and hit the subscribe button. You'll really, really enjoy the different topics of speaking about, yeah. you know, virtual, virtual assistance, legal bankruptcy at all. So uh, yep. tune in, subscribe. All right. Well, Adam, well, where can people find you online? I think that's very important because after they hear this, you're going to have 2 million followers. I can almost oh, please. assure it. Please. You can find me on, on the LegalSoft website and or if you ever want to have a phone call, you can reach me at adam at LegalSoft.com. That's my email address. And we can set up an appointment. I can have my virtual assistant send out a link, a booking link. We can set a calendar appointment. You can find me there. If you want to book a call with me, You'll see my l links below. You can set an appointment there and or you can always send me a personal email at adam at LegalSoft.com and I will respond. Well, I would like to say thank you very much to all of our podcast listeners for listening in to our small little interview with Adam Reitman, our, our director of law firm Growth. Um, he's done been amazing. If you click at the subscribe button and the emails right below. You'll be able to contact Adam at any time. Thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you soon. My pleasure. It's been a blast. Thanks so much to you. I hope you enjoyed our podcast with Adam Ryman. If you'd like to watch and listen to more episodes like today with Adam Reitman, don't forget to like and subscribe and comment below on what you feel your law firm could be doing better. We're always looking for a new guest on our podcast. Click the link below and hopefully we can see you as a guest. Mm -hmm.